Okay, this is probably going to be the most interesting lecture when it comes to recurrent neural networks because we're not going to do, do anything complicated. It's all going to be basic. Uh, can you shut your phone? This is okay. All right. So uh, we're going to pick up where we left off. What was the last thing we did? Nancy? Bidirectional neural, recurrent neural networks. And uh, questions we had were first, here's the story so far. We saw that iterated structures are good for analyzing time series with short time dependence on the past. So uh, these were where the output at any time depended on the inputs for the past few instances. That was it, right? We had a name for this. This was, what was this? Say it loud. Okay, yeah. I, usually when I ask you a question, the answer is either on this, the current slide or the next slide, right? I'm just trying to see how aware you are. Uh, <laughs> and we also saw that if you want to analyze things with, with uh, where you want information to be carried over very long periods of time, then time delay structures, simple, simple uh, convolu convolutional structures are not going to carry that much information. What you really need are recurrent structures, which can capture long-term depend dependence on the past, right? So this sort of gives you the impression that recurrent structures are really good for problems which require long-term uh, dependence, or so where long-term dependence is, is or to state it uh, the other way, recurrent structures are required only where you're sort of, sort of hoping to capture long-term dependence. That's not entirely true. So let's look at some other problems. Here is uh, a problem of addition. Now, if I want to build a fixed size MLP, which can add to n-bit numbers, what is the size of that MLP going to be? Oh, okay, you don't need to pass the sheet around house here. Come on now. <laughs> What's the size of that MLQ going to be? That's the, the width of the first layer. Or just, yeah, however you do it, right? 2n. 2n. Okay, so let's try dot plotting this, right? Suppose I'm doing, I'm trying to add just two bit, two one bit numbers. How many bits will I need in the output? Two, right? So what is the size of the truth table going to be? It's going to be two cross two, right? If I draw a Carnot map, it's going to be something like this, where this is zero, zero. These are the inputs. These are the outputs, right? Zero, one, 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 zero, because they had to be contiguous. I can do the same here, right? Zero, 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 one, 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 zero. Which are the regions of this uh, map that must be shaded? Taisha, the inputs versus the outputs, right? When the input is 0, 0, what do you want the output to be? 0, 0, right? When the output input is 0, 1, what do you want the output to be? 0, 1. When the input is 1, 1, what do you want the output to be? 1, 0. And when the input is 1, 0, what do you want the output to be? 0, 1. How are you going to group this? Right? You can scale this up. This just doesn't naturally group. In fact, the pattern begins to look random, right? So if you want to actually build a network that requires, that adds two n-bit numbers, which are both fed in simultaneously, and you want to learn this operation, right? How large is the network going to be? What do you think? How, large, how big is it going to be? Fixed size, linear in n, polynomial in n, exponential in n, what will it be? Polynomial. polynomial. So look over here, right? We found that it actually goes the size of this box. What is the size of this box in n? It's. What is the size of this box, right? It's, it's a truth table. Well, how many rows in your truth table? 2 raised to n, it's exponential, right? And you got some random subset of those guys that are firing, and you can't really say which. So that means the actual complexity of the function itself is kind of exponential, right? If you want a fixed size circuit. Uh, 
And if you want to learn it, how are you going to learn it? Once again, you're going to need an exponential number of inputs because you want to see every pair of input, input patterns and see the corresponding output, right? So this is actually going to become very, not only is the network going to be large, if you want to learn that what you're really trying to see is addition, then the amount of training data required is also going to be exponentially large. But then let's simplify the problem. Nobody ever implemented an addition circuit like this. And you know why, right? This is how you do it. So you're trying to, now here's another problem. If I build a circuit here for that, that can add two n-bit numbers, if I give it an n plus one bit number, can you even use this circuit? You cannot, it only takes two n inputs, right? But here's a different version of the same problem. And I'm going to do the summation one bit at a time. So if I do the summation one bit at a time, how, what is the size of this circuit? It's literally going to be, this is, you have two inputs, you have two outputs, right? But then uh, it's actually just going to be a very simple circuit, which is all you require is this little truth table, which has four neurons in the worst case, right? Because this is what you get for one bit. And then you're going to be carrying over something to the next state, uh, to the next bit, and repeat this operation. So by just recasting this as a recurrent problem, although it was an actual circuit, it was still exponential in size for one bit, over, the si over n bits, it didn't really increase in size. It was linear in the number of bits, right? I mean, it wasn't even linear, it was fixed sized. It's, a, it's just a recurrent network. And the computation is linear in the number of bits. Moreover, as you get more, as this is not catering just to fixed size inputs anymore, if the size of the input increases, the circuit would just go ahead and compute the output, right? So as you can see, a recurrent structure is able to compute using very few neurons what a fixed structure would take an exponential number of neurons to compute. So it's not merely for problems that require recurrence, that, that, that require long-term dependencies. There are other problems as well where recurrence structures are just the natural answer. So here's another problem, the XR. Now we've seen this XR problem several times before. If I want a fixed size circuit, what was the size of the circuit in, in the number of bits? Also exponential, right? It wasn't quite true to the end. People have come up with smarter answers, but it's still exponential. The XR circuit becomes very large if you want a fixed size circuit for any N. But then if I want to do this, and if I want to train a circuit, if I just give it the correct architecture, and I want to train it using inputs, again, I'm going to have to see all the XR patterns because XRs are effectively random looking, right? So you're going to need very large circuits and a very large amount of training data. Now, if I want to build a recurrent circuit, this is it, right? It's a single XR which scrolls over to the next bit. How many uh, neurons will this require? Three, right? And how much training data will this require? Hardly anything, a few, few instances. So what, you can see how just recasting uh, recurrent structure, uh, even MLP structures as recurrent structures can vastly improve the efficiency of the computation, both in terms of the amount of compute, the size of the circuit, and the uh, amount of training data required to learn the function. So in other words, recurrent structures can solve, can do what static structures cannot, right? Even for problems where a static structure may, might actually seem the appropriate thing to do. So here's the story so far. Uh, the recurrent, now we've seen, how, Continuing before I close this, we've seen how recurrent structures can be trained. They can be trained by minimizing the divergence between sequences of outputs and sequences of desired outputs. This too we have seen, right? And this can be done through gradient descent and BPTT. There's nothing special about one-step recursion. You can actually have recursion over multiple instants of time. And if the recursion gets deeper, then you're gonna have uh, more uh, initial states to keep track of. Now, let's go back to an old problem. Here is my static structure, right? Remember this, this is not a recurrent structure. What is the structure? 
this is a finite state, a finite response system. This is particular. This is a time delay neural network, right? I'm giving you a, the criterion that the input is always bounded. What is the condition under which the output will explode? It will never explode, right? Simply because the output depends on a finite number of inputs. And unless the activations themselves have singularities, this output is going to remain bounded if the input is always bounded. So this has what is called bounded input, bounded output stability, right? So time delay structures have bounded output if the function has bounded output for bounded input, and which is true for pretty much all your activation functions, and the input itself is bounded. So if the input is not exploding, the output is not exploding. It's bounded input, bounded output. So that's, that's called BIBO stability, right? Let's look at recurrent structures. Is this going to be BIBO? What do you think? You guys? You would guess no, obviously, because I'm asking the question, right? He's playing psychology rather than logic. <laughs> but that's not what I'm expecting of you. <laughs> this is first. Uh, so what are the conditions under which the output is never going to explode? Infinite, right? Yeah. It's recurrent, right? So first, of course, that if the input and output hidden activations are bounded, then the output can't, can't explode. So things exploding are not really an interesting uh, uh, issue. What, what we are more concerned with is will things saturate? Will, keep, will things give us meaningless results? And so in this case, our notion of BIBO stability really is a system whose output carries information about the input and doesn't just saturate or go to bad places, right? But then let's go back and look at the situation where the activations are linear. If the activations are linear, the reason we're going to be looking at uh, activa linear activations is uh, it's simple, so right? Now again, before we continue to analyze this, look at how the whole network behaves the output depends only on the current hidden activation, right? So if you want to know if the output is going to explode or, if the, or how the output is going to behave, we really want to see how the hidden layer is responding. So it's sufficient to analyze the behavior of the hidden layer because it carries all the relevant information. And so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to assume only a single hidden layer for simplicity, right? Now let's analyze the simple problem of, of linear activations, and the reason we are used, going to analyze linear activations is our street light effect that, uh, you know, we're really good at analyzing linear stuff. Nonlinear stuff are hard to analyze. So let's go look for the keys where, you know, there's light. So here's what the linear system looks like. This, all activations are identity functions. So if we're going to analyze linear systems, we will extrapolate to nonlinear systems subsequently. So the input, if you're, we are only interested in the hidden layer, right? The affine combination of the hidden layer is going to be some weighted combination of the hidden layer at the previous time, plus some weighted combination of the input. Right now, I'm not explicitly showing you the bias. I'm assuming the bias is part of the input, right? And so this is the affine combination. The H as the, the output, because the activation is linear, is simply the affine combination itself. So we can write this like so. Uh, we can write using this equation, HK is, what is it, W, H, HK minus 1 plus W, and what is it, X, XK. But then what is HK minus 1? HK minus 1 was WH hk minus 2 plus wx xk minus 1, right? Using the same equation. I've just taken this one step back. So if I plug that in here, what do I get hk in terms of hk minus 2? That's going to be wh squared hk minus 2, right? Plus wh wx xk minus 1 
plus W x x k. Right? I'm just taking this one step back. But then I can take this one step back further back. I can say h of k minus 2 equals w h h of k minus 3 plus w x x of k minus 2. I'm just expanding the recursion. You guys can do this math in your mind, right? in your heads. But this is just making it explicit. So that's going to be w h cubed because I'm writing expanding this term h of k minus 3 plus w h squared w x x k minus 2 and then I get this term itself which is w h x k is it right no, w x x k minus 1 plus w x x k so you can see how this is expanding out. As I keep writing this out, what you get is this term, which looks only at h, and then subsequent operations look at every single step of x, right? So if I expand the whole thing out, this is what you're going to get. hk is going to be, if you go all the way back to the beginning of time, it's wx h raised to k plus 1 times h minus 1. Plus, just look at how this is how this is expanding out here, right? So it's going to be uh, x k is uh, eventually you're going to go k, k goes to zero, so x zero times w h raised to x k plus x one times w h raised to k minus one plus x two times w h raised to k minus two, and so on. It's just a standard convolution operation. So this w x can be ignored as far as our uh, as far as uh, our analysis is concerned. So I've written this, this down. Now observe what this actually ends up looking at, right? This, is, this term over here is a response to an input at time 0, measured at time, at time k, assuming there is no other input, because the whole thing is linear, right? So if h minus 1 were 0, this would go away. If the subsequent inputs were zero, all of these guys would go away. They'd all become zero, right? So in other words, this is simply the input in response to a, this is the output in response to an input at time zero, assuming everything else is zero. And uh, so I can write the whole thing like so. I can write this matrix operation as hk, h minus, I can uh, think of, wait, yeah. This is the response at time zero, at time k, in, uh, uh, in response to the initial condition, assuming everything else is zero, plus this is the response at time k, assuming an input at time zero, everything else, assuming everything else is zero, and so on. So each term over here corresponds to one term in the upper equation. And now because the system is linear, I can consider x zero itself to be a scaling factor, I can pull it out, so I can write it like so, right? Where I can say that the kth input has a height of one, and the actual value is just a scaling factor. It comes out, right? And so I can write this whole thing as uh, the initial condition times a response to having a 1 as the initial condition, plus x0 times the response to having a 1 at time 1, at time 0, plus h1 times the response to having a 1 at time 1, and so on. I've just sort of uh, expanded this out, right? So, and again, this is there's something wrong with this equation. If I want to do this, if, I, if I'm saying this is good for scalars, if I want to make this a vector, it'll turn out that each of these guys is a matrix and the x will go to the right. But, uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's more about the niceties of the problem. We're only trying to analyze this, uh, analyze the recursion, right? So we're just, we're looking at linear activations. And when we look at linear activations, we find that the response at any time can be thought of as the summation of the responses to the individual inputs, assuming everything else is zero. And so that in turn tells us that if I want to figure out how this system is going to behave, I can assume that this guy and everything else are zero and just look at the response to what happens if I give it a single input at time zero, right? And if that blows up, then I can expect the system to blow up. If that doesn't blow up, I can expect the system to not blow up. So uh, we can sort of, because, 
using the principle of superposition, if I know how the system responds to a single input at any time, I could, the overall response to the system is simply the sum of the responses to inputs at individual times. Yeah? So this clear to everyone? Now this is the most complicated thing you're going to look at all day. So this had better be clear to you. Right? And now let's see how this responds. Let's take the case of a scalar. Right? If I take this case of, where, of a scalar, scalar recurrence, so ht is w times ht minus 1 plus cxt. Okay? Now assume that h minus 1 is 0 and my x consists of a single input at time 0 where c of x 0 is 1 and everything else is 0. Okay? Then what will the output at time t be? So at time 0, it's going at, you're going to see h of 0 equals whatever, I'll call this 1, right? Because I'm going to say c times x 0 equals 1. And so h of 1 is simply going to be w because, because there are no other inputs. Everything else is 0, right? And in R, more generally, uh, h of t is w raised to t times c times x 0, right? Just recursing this. The subscript 0 means that the input occurred at time 0. And this is the response at time t, okay? Now, how is this going to behave? Is this going to be stable? Is it going to be static? Is it going to die or is it going to blow up? When will it blow up? If w is greater than 1, this is exponential. It's going to grow up. Uh, just keep growing. What happens if w is less than 1? It's just going to go down to 0, right? The only condition under which this remains stable is if w is exactly equal to 1. So this is for, uh, so you can see what happens with different values of w out here in the plots. And you can see how it, you know, dies really quickly. Eventually it dies, okay? Now, uh, I can do the same thing with vector recursion, okay? And the equation is going to stay much the same. So the response at time t, the, the hidden response at time t, uh, hidden, uh, uh, hidden activation at time t in response to an input at time 0 is simply going to be w, w raised to t, which is the recurrent weight, times the input, c times x0, right? And now I can write this weight matrix using eigen decomposition as as u times lambda u inverse. This is just the standard eigenvalue decomposition of the weights matrix. And what do we know about the columns of u? What do we know about the columns of u? You mean the decomposition? U's, u are the eigenvectors, right? So what will they? The columns of u are, are they going to be linearly independent? Yeah. Right? So. The, in eigen decomposition, your eigenvectors are going to be linearly independent, and they span the space, correct? And furthermore, you also have this relationship that for any eigenvector, w times u is lambda u, right? Now, I can write this just representing cx as x prime. I can say x prime is some a1 times u1 plus a2 times u2 because the eigenvectors span the space, I can represent the input in terms of the eigenvectors themselves. And so I can write x prime, this that x prime is simply some linear combination of the eigenvectors. If I multiply this by w, what happens? The, this is going to be, since x prime is a0, whatever u0 plus a1, u1, and so on. So w times x prime is going to be w times this guy. Right? This is a scalar, this comes out, so I can write this as a0 times w u0. And because u, each of the u's is simply an eigenvector, this is simply going, w times u is simply going to be lambda times u. Right? So what you will find is that if I multiply this x prime by w, it's just going to be a1 times lambda 1 u1 plus a2 times lambda 2 u2 and so on. Every time I multiply by w, this a lambda stays, and the w only multiplies u, so I'm going to get an additional lambda, right? And so if I multiply this by w raised to t, it's just going to be a1 times lambda 1 raised to t plus a2 times lambda 2 raised to t, and so on. Make sense, right? Now, eventually, 
as you as t goes to infinity, what happens? Because you're always raising the lambdas to an exponent, the highest lambda is going to rise much faster than the rest of the guys. And when t becomes very large, all you're left with is simply a contribution of the largest eigenvector of w, right? So what happened? Do we remember anything about the input? No, right? The only thing that, re that remained was the largest eigenvector of w, right? All of these other a's were disappear had disappeared. You had some information about the direction, the, con the component along the largest eigenvector of w, but that's it. There's, not, there's nothing much more that you're remembering, right? So, the, uh, so for any input, for large t, the length of the hidden vector will expand or contract according to the tth power of the largest eigenvalue, right? Uh, unless, of course, the input doesn't have a, a component along the largest eigenvector, in which case it's going to begin expanding against the second largest eigenvector. But the point is that at the end of it all, if the largest eigenvector is greater than one, the response is going to increase rapidly. Because as you will, as you see, the response is actually here, right? I don't need to sh show this, right? The response is simply lambda raised to t, right? And if the largest eigenvector is less than one, the response is going to fall off exponentially fast. So in other words, the behavior, the ability of, the, of this network to remember things depends on the largest eigenvalue of w. Make sense, right? Yeah. Um, why is Ds equal to a linear combination of the eigenvectors? Because the eigenvectors span the space. They are linearly independent. So I can represent Cx, any vector, as a linear combination of these eigenvectors. Aren't the eigenvectors w's eigenvectors? It doesn't matter, right? You give me a set of linearly independent vectors which span the space, I can represent any vector as a linear combination of these guys, right? That's all it is. I just happen to choose the eigenvectors. Yeah? Oh, and how do you know um, the Cx prime must be in the space of eigenvectors? Because the eigenvectors span the space, right? For any w, eigen decomposition will give you a set of eigenvectors which span the space, right? Okay, so suppose I replace this with vector recursion. You're going to have the same issue, right? This was, so this was, by the way, uh, so this was, yeah, this was vector recursion, right? I'm sorry. So let's actually plot this recursion. Now, here's what happens. This is the same equation. Here is an issue, here is an example where I have chosen a single input, which is all ones, but it's normalized to length one. So it's divided by two, I think. And so I'm plotting the length of the output as a function of recursion iteration. So you can see uh, what happens here. I'm not really sure. I have two different cases. In both cases, the second eigenvector is, eigenvalue is different. But then, uh, so I have two plots. One of them has, in both cases, the largest eigenvalue is 0.9, but the second eigenvalue, second largest eigenvalue is different. And you see what's happening. The whole thing sort of goes down, right? If the largest eigenvalue happens to be greater than one, it just blows up. If the largest eigenvalue happens to be, have a magnitude of one, it stays flat. There's some oscillation. Why is the oscillation? You guys. Yeah. Yes, you're just, you're well, you're halfway there, right? Do eigenvalues have to be real? No, so these are complex eigenvalues. I can, you can actually see, and you know, you just have to look at the slides, right? So when you have complex eigenvalues, you're gonna get this oscillatory behavior, but the overall tendency pretty much shows what you have over here, right? If you have real eigenvalues, here's what you get. You get this nice smooth explosion or nice smooth, you know, or nice smooth collapse if the largest eigenvalue is less than one. Right? Now, so what we have done so far is to analyze linear activations, right? But can we actually 
So, in linear systems long term behavior depends entirely on the eigenvalues of the hidden layer with weights matrix. If the largest eigenvalue is greater than 1, it is going to blow up. If the largest eigenvalue is less than 1, the response is going to vanish very quickly, very, very quickly. And complex eigenvalues can cause oscillatory behavior which we may, you may or may not want. So, if you want them to be smooth, you want to make sure that your eigenvalues are real. One way of doing this is the weight, weights matrix is uh, symmetric, right. But anyway, uh, what happens, let us let's, uh, ignore what is on the board for the moment, right. What happens if I actually introduce a non-linearity? We have only looked at linear systems, right. What would happen if I introduced a non-linearity? So, I have xt or ht equals sigma of whatever wht minus 1 plus x, x0. I'm, I am ignoring the weights, okay. So, if sigma is a sigmoid, what happens? Let us look, let us actually plot it out. So, what will a sigmoid look like? It is going to look like something like this, correct? So, what is the largest slope of the sigmoid? The one, right? Or if it is going to be w if you also have the weight, okay. Let us assume that the, let us, the slope is, w, is 1 for now. Suppose my initial value is out here, where will the next value be? The initial value h0 is here, then I am going to read this, that is your height, the next value is going to be here, right? Make sense? Because the next time I am operating on the sigmoid compressed output. Correct? Make sense to everybody? Right? And then where will the next value be? It is going to go, you are going to check here, somewhere here, you come here, it is going to shrink, right? Where will it stop? Where will it stop? At the at the origin, right? At the origin, or will it stop at the origin? It's not going to stop at the origin, right? Because if you come to the origin over here, what happens? So you go here. You're going to go. You're going to read this. You're going to go away from the origin. It's actually going to stop at some location, which is not the origin. The actual height at which it's going to stop is going to be a function of the slope itself, w, and a second term, which is the bias, right? So let's ignore the bias. I should actually delete that from the slides. I'll, I'll fix that, okay? But what you see is here is how the activation response for different values of the weight. And you can see it very quickly converges to a, va to a, to a value which depends only on the, on the weight and then stops at that value, right? What about if I use a tan h? A tan h, can, this is actually centered at the origin, right? So a tan h has a somewhat different response. And in the tan h, it's actually going to sort of go towards 0 as you can see. But and the rate at which it goes towards 0 depends on the weight. But in the case of the tan h, observe the compare the tan h to the sigmoid, the tan h actually saturates, falls to 0 somewhat slower than the sigmoid because it is bipolar, right? What about a ReLU? If I were use, using a ReLU activation, if the initial value is positive and if the weight is positive, greater than 1, it is going to blow up. If the initial value is positive and the weight is less than 1, it is going to disappear, right? So, this is where the initial value was on the right hand side. Suppose I started off with an initial value on the left hand side of 0. You are going to get exactly the same behavior. You are going to have this guy, but it is going to start at this end. Eventually, it is going to end up at the same spot, right? It is going to cross, it is going to end up where the saturate at a value that depends only on the weight. Does 
It doesn't depend where you start from, it's always going to end up at the same place, right? And so, so also with tan h. And in the case of the ReLU, if your initial value is negative, the output is zero, it's never going to change. So it just saturates, right? So what we observe over here is, uh, I, can I can do the same thing for vector processes. For scalars, you can actually visualize what goes on. You can write this out. For vectors, you're going to have to, the anal analysis is a little more complex, but here I'm using this recursion. I'm assuming a uniform uh, unit vector initialization. And you can see that if I start with all ones, for sigmoids, it quickly saturates and ends up at 1.35 in this case. For tan h's, it saturates somewhat slower, but it's, they're all going to end up at the same place. And for relus, in this case, my weights matrix has eigenvalues greater than one, it's just going to blow up, right? So on the other hand, if I start on the negative side with all minus ones, the behavior looks much the same, nothing really changed. So what are we observing over here of all of these? Uh, we are going to find that, you know, if you actually want to do a full stability analysis of what happens to this, you're going to have to consider things like Lyapunov functions and uh, Ruth's criterion, but the conclusions are only are similar. Regardless of which activation that you use, the things eventually sort of saturate. Sigmoids saturate really quickly. Tan H has retained some information about where you started from for a longer period of time, but then they saturate. And ReLUs are horrible. You just don't use ReLUs, right? So, which is why when you actually use uh, recurrent neural networks, the activation function that you will use for, for the hidden layer, not the output layer, right, is typically going to be a tan h because the tan h is what actually retains memory about stuff long enough. But eventually, even here, the behavior depends on the parameters of the network. If you wait long enough, the tan h is going to give you rubbish. The value that it retains is only going to depend on the parameters of the network and nothing else, right? Not what you're trying to remember. Make sense to everybody? Okay. I can also add deeper recursion to try to remember things more, you know, better, which go further back. So instead of having a one-step recursion, maybe I have a five-step recursion and so on. What you'll find is that instead of having a simple, uh, you know, monotonic response, is you're going to have this modal response but the overall behavior remains pretty much the same. Uh, you're going to find the conclusions don't really change. You're gonna to have to analyze things using a little more complex math, but the conclusions do not change. You're going to find that the behavior, the ability of the system to remember things, to know what it has processed so far, depends now on the parameters of the network and not on what it's trying to remember, okay? So the story so far, Recurrent networks retain information from the infinite past in principle. In practice, they tend to blow up. And in practice, they, they tend to either blow up or forget. And whether they blow up or forget is a function of the eigenvalues of the recurrence weight matrix. If the largest eigenvalue is less than one, the response dies down very quickly. If the largest eigenvalue is greater than one, it tends to blow up. If you introduce nonlinearities, it's going to a change a little bit, sigmoid activation saturate and the network becomes unable to retain new information once the thing saturates, right? And uh, ReLU activations blow up or vanish rapidly. Tan H, tan, tan H activations tend to retain memory a bit longer, but not a whole lot more. Right? Okay, so here's where we stand. RNNs are excellent models for time series analysis like prediction, classification, sequence prediction. They can even simplify problems which look like they're designed for MLPs. You can do, redo them using RNNs and you can get better solutions. But the problem is that the memory isn't all that great. They tend to, uh, they tend to not remember things that you want them to remember. And the manner in which they forget is a, or is a function of the, of the network itself rather than what it is you're trying to remember. There's another problem, uh, which is the problem of vanishing gradients. This is a problem for any deep network. If any, this is, not, this is nothing specific to recurrent networks. This holds true for any sufficiently deep network. And here is the situation, right? The gradient of the error with respect to the parameters of the network becomes, is very unstable, particularly near the early layers of the network. So why so? Now, look at this. <clears throat> 
for any MLP, I can write say at the input, right? At the input layer, I'm going to have say W0x, and then I have some activation FWX, and this is going to be the output of the first hidden layer, right? The second hidden layer is going to multiply this by W1. I'm ignoring the bias. And then you're going to apply the activation function to it. So this is the output of the second hidden layer. And then the third hidden layer is going to apply some weight to this. And you're going to apply some activation to it. This is the output of the third hidden layer, and so on. So the network is simply just a nested function, where each layer represents one layer, one uh, of the network represents one layer of nesting in the function itself. The divergence is a function that's applied to the outermost computation. So the divergence also is just a nested function as a consequence, right? Now, here's what we have. This is, every, I've got terrible notation, but you get the, this is only meant to give you an idea. Suppose I have some function, I mean, a function of this kind, some function of some w times some other function g of x, okay? And I want the derivative of this function f with respect to x. If I decompose it, the derivative of f with respect to x can be written as the derivative of f with respect to its argument, which is wgx, times the derivative of the argument wgx with respect to g of x, times the derivative of g of x with respect to x. This is just, a chain, just the chain rule. This intermediate guy, derivative of w, w times anything with respect to that, so that anything is simply w, right? So I can rewrite this as derivative of f with respect to wg times w times the derivative of g with respect to x. So let wg be z. So I simplify the notation. Now I can actually write this in vector format. So this derivative of the divergence with, of, of f with respect to x is going to be the sequential product of the derivative of f with respect to z times w, because that's the derivative of z with respect to g, right? Times the derivative of g with respect to x. So this guy is the Jacobian of f with respect to, uh, this guy is the Jacobian of f with respect to z. This guy is the Jacobian of g with respect to x, right? Okay. Or uh, so, everybody clear about this is just a standard shader. Now let's write out the derivative of the divergence with respect to the innermost, say, variable. So, or some inner, some inner function. Remember, when you're doing back propagation, you keep propagating the derivatives backwards through the layers. So at each time, at each step, you're computing the derivative with respect to the output of one of the layers, right? So, you, so, so you're, you're uh, com so uh, let's, uh, see how this derivative can be written. Using the same principle that I have over here, this derivative is the derivative of the divergence with respect to any intermediate f is going to be the derivative of, the, of d with respect to its argument times the derivative of this guy with respect to its argument times this w times the derivative of this guy with respect to its argument and so on, going on inwards, right? Exactly as we wrote it earlier. So this is what it's going to look like all the way to the kth layer, where each of these guys, when I take of the, think of the derivative of this function f with respect to its argument, that's basically a Jacobian, right? It's the derivative of an activation function for a layer. So these guys are Jacobians, and these guys are weights matrices, okay? So let's just consider these Jacobians for a recurrent neural network, or more generally for any network, okay? What do these Jacobians look like? Now, typically, except for your outermost layer, the uh, innermost layers, have, the, the inner layers in your network have uh, scalar activations, right? So when I have a uh, network of this kind, the Jacobian is going to just be a bunch of diagonal terms because the off-diagonal terms are usually going to be zero, right? Especially for a recurrent network of this kind, this is basically what the structure, the structure that you will get. Now, uh, this Jacobian, the diag we only for scalar activations, we're only worried about the diagonal terms. 
the diagonal terms are going to be bounded if the slope of the activation function itself is bounded. And the slope of the activation, the activation function is always going to be bounded because we never use activations which simply blow up, right? What are the kinds of activations we use? Sigmoids, tan H's, ReLU's. So here's what the derivatives look like. Consider a sigmoid. I've erased it, right? The sigmoid slope starts at zero, peaks at one, goes back to zero, right? For tan H, the slope starts at zero, and once again, it peaks at, I think, one, then goes back to zero, right? In every case, the largest value for this guy, for a ReLU, the slope is either zero or one, right? The largest value for this guy, this diagonal term, is one. In general, the diagonal term for the Jacobian is going to be less than one, right? So what happens over here? As I compute my, perform my back propagation going back through the network, the gradients which start at the outermost layer, as they keep getting propagated backwards, every time they hit one of these Jacobians, they shrink. What? The other term is these weights. Now, what happens at these weights? These weights matrices will have singular values which are greater or less than one. At layers where the singular values are all less than one, the derivative is going to shrink. In layers where some of the singular values are greater than one, the derivative is going to expand in the direction of the singular vectors corresponding to the singular value greater than one. And in the other directions, it's going to shrink, right? So as you keep going backwards through the network, repeated multiplications by these weights matrices is going to either make some directions really grow rapidly, which are the di directions which correspond to singular values greater than one, and the other directions are gonna shrink, right? So the derivatives will either explode, a small number of derivatives will explode, because the uh, number of, the, the component of the derivatives in terms of these large singular values is gonna be really small, and most of the der derivatives are simply gonna shrink, and they become very small. So the overall behavior, now for the overall behavior, we have to consider the combination of these guys, right? E, the Jacobian times the corresponding weight. And so if you look at the, the product of these guys, if this combination has uh, singular values which are less than one, the, de the derivatives are gonna keep shrinking. For some of them, the singular values might be larger than one in those directions, they're going to explode. So the chain product, the, uh, the, as a, for uh, the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of any layer will expand in directions where each stage has singular values greater than one and it's going to shrink where each stage has singular values less than one. Yeah. So, uh, so first greater than So again, exactly how this behaves, uh, how the gradients get adjusted are going to depend on the on the uh, uh, divergence itself, right? So let's consider for now. You're speaking of behavior through the training, right? Let's not even worry about about, about that. Let's actually look at what happens if you actually try to. Uh, try to train these guys and we will see and we will and maybe I'll also answer your question in a couple of slides right so the overall behavior is going to be something like this right this is the gradients in the lower earlier layers can explode or vanish typically they're going to vanish for most of the uh, parameters for some of them they're really going to become very large so if you start off and as you keep going backwards through a layer through a network by the, by the time you get to this initial, uh, initial, these initial layers, the derivatives are going to become very unstable. Mostly they're going to be zero, and maybe one or two have to carry the weight of the entire, the bur you know, the entire burden, and those things are going to explode. Let's actually try visualizing some of these. This is for a 19-layer MNIST model. This is the output layer. You're going back, and now this is at the initialization. This probably also answers Jeshen's question, right? 
at what stage in your training do you expect the derivatives to be largest? At the beginning or the end? You should be sure about this, right? At what stage do you expect the derivatives to be largest? At the beginning of training, because you're in a random location, right? You're doing gradient descent. At the end, you're going to be close to the optimum. You expect your derivatives to be small, right? This is at the very first, this is at the initialization. It's randomly initialized. So you expect all derivatives to be large or small? Large, right? So here's the output. And here I'm using an ELU activation. And this is the derivatives going, these are the derivatives going towards the input. Do you see any derivatives out here? None at all. They become vanishingly small, right? In fact, they're one or two really bright dots, but the rest of them are just basically rubbish, right? This is for an ELU activation. This is over, uh, this is the uh, average divergence over many, uh, the entire training set. This is with a ReLU activation. And you can see that it fades even faster, right? There's some information, it's the overall picture is slightly brighter. Uh, that's part to do with the, with, the, with, the, with the visualization and partly to do with the, do with the fact that uh, 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 some things actually blew up a little more here. So, but compare these two. Here the derivatives go much deeper. Here they die quickly. This is for sigmoid. They die even faster. This is for tan H. They die equally fast. So overall, the response that you're seeing is that the derivatives sort of vanish really quickly after just a few layers going backwards, right? This is over the entire training set. Suppose I look at individual instances. And here I'm looking at, for the, look at, I'm considering just the ELU activation, which was the one that carried the derivatives farthest. And you can see once again that even for individual instances, you have basically the same behavior. As you go backwards from the output layer to the input layers, the derivatives are just vanishing. And you know exactly why this is happening. Because as you go back, those, uh, uh, the, the weights matrices are mostly shrinking your derivatives, and the Jacobians too are shrinking your derivatives, right? So uh, ELU activations maintain gradients larger, longest, but in all cases, the gradients effectively vanish after about 10 layers in this example. And this is true for both batch gradients and gradients for individual instances. Now, this is true for any generic model, nothing, nothing to do with recurrent networks, but then if I uh, think for think of what happens with ref recurrent networks. Recurrent networks are just very deep networks, so the same problem happens. So here's the story so far. Recurrent networks retain information from the infinite past in principle. In practice, they are really bad at memorization. The hidden inputs can blow up or shrink to zero depending on the eigenvalues of the recurrent weights. Also, deep networks suffer, suffer from a vanishing or explode, exploding gradient problem where the gradient of the error at the output of the loss gets concentrated into a small number of parameters in the initial layers, and most of them don't get enough to actually get reasonable updates. Right? So going back to our recurrent networks, now consider the response of a network where you have just one input and you don't have any subsequent inputs. Yeah. Uh, so does this mean that actually regularization doesn't help much? So, uh, Regularization by, regularization is answering a different problem over here, right? The problem of transmitting gradients is, somewhat, is, is different from the problem of having a, having a model that has additional constraints. So unless wh whatever mechanism that you're using to regularize has a way of passing the gradients on so that they don't vanish, it won't help by itself, right? This has more to do with the dynamics of this equation going backwards, right? Now, remember, what do we want in a recurrent network? We want the recurrent network to be able to remember things for very long periods of time. So in other words, if I have an input here and I have an output there, then uh, if we actually uh, pass the derivatives back from here to here, then what would happen? I want this network to be able to remember that something interesting happened here. Will it ever be able to learn this? Not really, because as you wait longer and longer, my derivative is going to become smaller and smaller. It just won't remember, right? So, uh, and it's not just when you're trying to learn stuff, 
things are actually being forgotten even going forwards. Why? Because if your weights have singular values less than one going backwards, they also have singular values less than one going forwards. So things are also being forgotten. This is basically what happened in our plots, remember? So um, by the way, I'm going to redraw things like this as we had in the past just to uh, you know, make things a little clearer, but you get the idea. Things get for forgotten in both the forward pass and in the backward pass. But then long-term dependency is a problem. Remember the very first thing that I showed you when I began talking about recurrent networks was a model that, that generated something that looked like a computer program. Or try, imagine writing a recurrent network. By the way, can, uh, imagine uh, writing a recurrent, I, a minute, I handed out an attendance sheet. Can you pick it up? I handed out an attendance sheet. So just, it's over there. Yeah. So what we wanted in the recurrent network was that uh, we wanted things to be remembered. Imagine writing a recur uh, re creating a recurrent network that can parse code. You wanted to remember that a parenthesis has been opened or a curly brace has been opened till it is closed and you have no idea when it's going to be closed. And you have to hang on to this information. Whereas what we have is a situation where, where whether it will be remembered or not depends on the parameters of the network and doesn't depend on the input itself, right? So let's try to fix that. And in the process of fixing it, we're going to go into this bizarre, bizarre domain of mystery and magic, uh, also called long short term memory networks, which are kind of hard to explain, but I will try to do so, right? So here is the situation we had. Going forward, things tend to get forgotten or maybe blow up in your face depending on the behavior of the product of W and F, right? Going backwards, you have these, uh, the same issue, right? The derivatives are going to be forgotten or blow up depending on the behavior of the, uh, depending on the weights matrix and the Jacobian, right? Now, this behavior, does it have anything to do with the input? Not really, right? The bounds in the Jacobian depend only on the nature of the activation function. And what about the, uh, the singular values of the weights? They have nothing to do with the input. They just depend on the weights, right? So in other words, whether the network remembers things or not is going to depend entirely on the parameters of the network rather than what it is trying to remember. So, so the fact that a curly brace has been opened is not something that's going to register on the network. It's going to remember it for just as long as it takes for the memory of it to vanish really quickly, depending on the weights of the network, right? So what we really want is a network that remembers arbitrarily long to, recall, to be recalled on demand. So you want something that, uh, that it does not be dependent on the vagaries of the network parameters, but rather than an input-based determination of whether it must be remembered. So you say, ah, here's a curly brace. This is important. I must remember it, right? As opposed to, here's, here's the character A. I must remember it for the end of, to the end of time. The reason the recurrent neural network actually fails its job is that in the standard framework, it would not distinguish between a curly brace and the F in the word for. Both are just the same, right? So it's not actually looking at the input to decide whether it must be remembered. And clearly it makes sense to forget that the word character F occurred in the word for very quickly. But the fact that the curly brace was opened must be remembered until the curly brace is closed. And this distinction is not actually being followed by the network, right? So can we replace the structure with something that doesn't fade or blow up, but that somehow naturally retains useful memory arbitrarily long. It should know what to remember and what it shouldn't remember. And forget it. And, and, uh, and if it finds something that, it, that is useful to remember, it should hang on to that memory for as long as is required until that memory is no longer required, right? That is the structure that we actually want, which the standard recurrent network doesn't give you. Which means that this kind of structure, or more generally, this kind of structure is not going to be okay, because if you have activations and you have weights, activations are going to shrink your memory, 
weights are going to modify your memory and both of these are going to be independent of what it is you're trying to remember. What you really want is a structure of this kind where you have some information extracted from the input and subsequently whether you're going to remember it or not is just based on a bunch of switches where at each time you say, okay, have I seen something that tells me that this input is no longer useful? If not, I'm going to keep it. And then the next time you say, okay, have I seen something that tells me this input is no longer useful? No, I keep it, right? So I've opened a curly brace. I look at the current input. Am I curling, closing this curly brace? No. I'm going to retain the memory. Okay, have I, have I closed the curly brace now? No, I'm going to retain the memory. Have I closed the curly brace now? Yes, okay, now I can forget this, right? So that's the kind of behavior you want. So in other words, you want a memory of this kind where you start off by detecting a pattern and subsequently whether you remember, continue to remember it or not is going to be a function of the input. And so also, that means you cannot have weights and you cannot have activations. The only thing that you can have are triggers which either bump up or bump down your memory. And of course, when I'm writing the derivatives, this is going to work all the way backwards. Once again, you will not have Jacobians and you're not going to have weights, right? Let's codify this. Make sense to everybody, right? So this is what it's going to be codified as. This is what's called the constant error carousal. You start off with some history, which is stored through this variable C, and this history is going to go unmodified through, it's not going to be modified and through any direct manipulation, it's gone, not being processed by some weights or through some activation. Instead, you're going to, so you have no weights, no nonlinearities. All you have are these scaling functions that tell you whether the history must be remembered or not, which is basically what we had in this equation, right? Make sense? So this is your, they call this uh, the constant error carousal. The actual nonlinear work, whether something must be done or not, whether some prediction must be made or not, whether something, you know, what to do with the input is going to be a function of the memory that is actually retained. So that you have some nonlinearities up here which actually operate on these guys and they do the actual work. Okay? So the structure tends to become a little more complex. The uh, whether this guy is remembered or not is actually processed through a gate and the gate uh, is dependent on the current input but also on what is currently uh, the, what the hidden state of the network itself is because you want to say have I the fact that I'm telling you to forget about a particular open brace must be dependent on the fact that A, I've seen the closed brace and B, I know that an open brace has been detected and is being stored. So obviously the switch has to depend both on the, on the current state of the system and the input. So the switch looks at the current input and the state of the system and other stuff because it may, this may depend on other things, right? Which includes what is actually being remembered, not just the state of the system. So this is what is called the long short term. Yes. X of t plus 1 is going to affect the switch which decides whether whatever is being carried on this line must be remembered or not. And so once C is modified, if C is, you know, this, so this output depends on C. So this does indeed eventually affect H. So, so, so it looks like, like the future time is affecting the output at T? Wait, X of t plus 1, this should have been, uh, I'm sorry, I think I have my indices wrong. You caught me. Can you know this, Don? Yes, yeah. So the point is this guy, you're putting some stuff on this switch, right? The switch should decide whether it should shrink or not. So the switch is going to be some value, yes. If the switch decides the memory should shrink, it will shrink. If the switch says the memory should not be modified, it won't be modified. The, the shrinking or expansion of the memory is now being made a function of the input rather than the parameters of the network, right? Okay, so this is the long short term memory network and the following notes actually uh, uh, 
borrow literally from this guy, cola at github.github.io. I just borrow the pictures. But here is your standard recurrent network, not the LSTM, right? Your standard recurrent network looked something like this. You had a hidden value that was combined, attached with your input, and then it went into uh, an activation, which was typically a tan H, and that produced your next out, next hidden value. And the output itself was computed on the hidden value. The LSTM looks a lot more complicated than this, right? But then it's not so complicated if you stop and think about what we just explained. The figure is, uh, uh, is a lot scarier than it needs to be. So let's tear this down, okay? Now again, every line over here is a full matrix. Every dot is a vector, right? Remember that we are seeing the entire network on, the, on its side. So remember, keep, keep this in mind. So when I have a C over here, this is not one thing being remembered. It's many things being remembered, as many things as the number of neurons you've got. Going in depth ways, okay? Just remember this. So let's look at this first guy. What is this first guy? This first guy is your constant error carousal. You have something that's remembered. It's actually a bank of things that's being remembered. I'm just showing this sideways. This bank of things is going to be affected by this switch, which says, should this continue to be remembered or not? And so it scales up or scales down the memory. And then an addition which says, should I augment this memory? So for example, you could say, should I continue to remember that I actually have seen an open brace? Have I seen yet another open brace, right? So, so uh, this is now augmented by, the, by this additive term. The actual switch is this guy, which is what is called the, uh, the switches are, you have multiple switches in the circuit and we'll explain them all, right? So uh, the switch generally tends to be of this kind. It's a sigmoid. It's a logistic function with an output, with output between zero and one on every line, which says whether something must be remembered or not, right? Ideally, it could be zero, or zero and one, but rather we like to keep it continuous for obvious reasons. It controls how much of the information is to be let through. The first gate over here, which multiplies the memory, is what we call the forget gate. The forget gate determines whether to carry over the history or to forget it. Literally, you look at the input, you look at the previous hidden state, and you operate on the two, decide whether whatever is currently being remembered on this line is worth rem continuing to remember or not. And so it produces computes an output which multiplies this memory. So that's your forget gate. Now observe that we are distinguishing between the hidden state and the memory. The hidden state is being computed from the memory the memory is being stored, okay? Because what we are really keen about is remembering the hidden state is just a part of the computational apparatus, right? The second gate over here, this term, it's actually, it's generally drawn as the, as the, as the product of a tan H and a sigmoid. And the general explanation is that the tan H, which operates on, so by the way, this is the equation, right, for this guy. It's a sigmoid which operates on a concatenation of the hidden state and the input. There's a bias, right? This tan H tries to detect patterns in the input. So the tan H is a pattern detector, which operates again on a combination of the hidden state and the input. There's a bias. But then the sigmoid decides whether the pattern that has been detected is worth remembering or not, worth adding to the memory or not. So you're always sort of controlling everything that happens. Did I find a curly brace? And is this curly brace worth adding to this counter, right? So the sigmoid might say, oh no, this curly brace happens to be in a common section, let's ignore it. But the tan H is going to say, I've seen a closed curly brace, right? But a different way of thinking about it is that this entire thing is just a more complex activation function, which is a product of two terms, one of which is a sigmoid and the other is a tan H. And so of course, you can see how, what that would look like. A tan H is going to look like so. A sigmoid is going to look like so, right? And what would the product of the two look like? It's going to be, it's going to start at zero because the sigmoid is always at zero, right? And it's going to end here, and then it's going to do something like this. So it just happens to be a more complicated activation function. Make sense to you guys, right? 
but the explanation that's generally given is a little more intuitive, that you detect patterns and decide whether they're worth remembering. Then the actual update of the memory cell happens in this manner. The current memory is multiplied by whatever the forget gate tells you, and then you have an addition, which is the output over here, which is the product of the input gate and the pattern detector in the input. Okay. Now, this memory goes through. And this memory is actually sort of processed by a tan h to actually compute the hidden value. But the hidden state, now here's where things get a little more bizarre because the hidden state also ends up being multiplied by yet another gate uh, which decides if the memory contents are worth reporting at this time or not. But once again, that's just the explanation that's given. It's probably more useful to think of this as this rather more complicated activation function. I mean, which of them is more intuitive to you really depends on you, right? But again, the memory is actually processed to compute a hidden value, and then further processing may decide whether this is worth reporting or not. So here is the complete set of, uh, 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 now, something that's often added is that instead of just looking at only the hidden state and the input, you can also just factor in the current memory of the system itself through what they call a peephole connection. Now, it just makes the whole, process, whole, whole system a little more complex because once you implement a basic concept, adding some complexity seems to be either a fashion or useful. I'm not really sure what. So they do that. But anyway, so uh, this is the, 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 these are additional connections that are added. So with everything tossed in, this is what the actual model looks like. But then once you break it down into all of its component constituent parts, you see that it's not really scary at all. It's very simple, right? And so these are all the uh, variables. I'll skip the equations, right? Now I can write the whole thing using code, pseudocode, which, which is fairly simple, which is going to look like this. Uh, this is, now remember that this whole box over here can be thought of as just one closed box, which represents one very complicated little unit in your recurrent network. And so we call that an LSTM cell over here, and the LSTM cell forward. And so the output at any time is going to depend on the hidden states and the memory at the previous time and the current input and the parameters of the cell itself. And, the entire and within the cell, this is the entire sequence of operations. You first compute the forget gate, which operates on some affine combination of all the parameters going in. You can compute the input gate. This, is, this detects the input pattern. So then you multiply the in detected input pattern with the input gate to decide if it's worth remembering. You multiply the hidden value coming in with the forget gate, to which tells you how much of it to forget. And the sum of these two tells you your new memory. Then you have the, uh, the uh, uh, output gate, which is being computed using this fellow. This is the, uh, this tan h is the activation which operates on the memory to compute the actual hidden state, and that's multiplied by the output gate. You return the h and the c, the memory and the hidden state value itself, right? So, and so if you were actually to write an entire network, the network is simply going to be a standard recurrent neural network where within hidden cells, the hidden layers, you now have the LSTM cell operating rather than just a simple activation like a tan h, which you had before. So once you, actually, once you begin implementing it, it actually looks very trivial. Now, how would backpropagation work over here? This looks ugly, right? Looks really hideous. So how are you actually going to compute your derivatives going backwards? I'm going to run over time a little bit, guys. Just bear with me. I do this every class, right? So let's consider the derivatives of the divergence with respect to C. There's a derivative which comes up this line, right? Then there's a derivative which also comes up this line. You're speaking of all over this, just about this C. There's a derivative which comes straight down this line. There's a derivative which comes up like so. Then there's a derivative which comes up like so. And there are a whole bunch of other terms. Uh, it's, if you actually begin writing out the equations one step at a time, you can, your head can spin really quickly. And I don't recommend it, right? Uh, same thing here. Let's try writing the derivatives with respect to the hidden state. Then you have something coming in from above. You have stuff coming in from here and from here and so on. 
keeps going on because the whole model looks so very complex. You're sort of beginning to draw the connections between within the box. But here's a much simpler way of, yeah, that's just to scare you. You're not supposed to remember, right? Uh, I'm not, and I'm not even doing this. This I leave to you as an exercise. But let's look at this in terms of code. And it's very simple. It extends a couple of slides. This is your forward. Look at the sequence of operations, right? The sequence of operations, you computed the forget gate, you computed the input gate, you detected the input pattern, you scaled down the memory and added the detected input pattern. Then you computed the output gate and you operated on the memory and multiplied it by the output gate and this is the entire sequence of operations. So clearly when you're computing your derivatives, you're going to be going backwards through this, right? So I'm going to take this one step at a time. I'm going backwards. This guy is, the first one is this, h equals o times tan, right? Tan, tan. So if you compute the derivative from this, assuming that you already have the derivative of with respect to h from the next instant, then the derivative with respect to o is simply dh times tan. The derivative with respect to tan is simply going to be this entire operation is going to be dh times o. And then you have to actually sort of, uh, tan is operating on the argument c. So the derivative with respect to c is this guy times one minus tan squared. I've just taken every line and decomposed it into its derivatives one step at a time, okay? Then let's, the, then I have the sigmoid. I can compute the same derivative going backwards. The derivative of the, I have the derivative, at this point I have a derivative with respect to O. So since I have DO, I need DZ0, which is very straightforward, which is DO times sigmoid times one minus sigmoid, right? Uh, then I have this very simple equation, which is the affine combination. I can compute the derivatives going backwards through the affine combination. So look at the slides, but there's a very nice set of slides where that we're putting up on how, on how to compute a derivative in this very complex scenario. And so I expect you to go through this. And of course, to make sure that you have gone through this, we're going to give you multiple homework problems, which ensure that you have gone through it, right? So, uh, uh, and the whole thing for reference. Now, one last topic, give me two minutes. The recurrent, the LSTM network we saw looked unnecessarily complex, right? So, there have been various uh, attempts at trying to simplify the LSTM because it seems to have a lot of gratuitous computation thrown in. There's a basic concept of trying to hang on to memory, but then there's so much more just going on that doesn't even seem to be necessary. In fact, if you guys sat down with the LSTM, I'm sure that you could each come up with your own simplification of it, which would work just fine because, because of the amount of gratuitous computation thrown in. And so the G GRU is one such attempt uh, which addresses some of the questions of, you know, why so much complexity? So let's look at what, what this guy does. This is just as an illustration, you guys are welcome to try your own models, right? Instead of having a forget and an input gate, it does something like this. It says if a new input is to be remembered, it means the old input memory must be forgotten. So you use one gate to adjust both the incoming memory and to de decide if the new patterns must be detected. You don't store, again, why do you need to store the memory and the hidden state separately when the hidden state is simply a function of the memory? This could actually be computed on the fly, right? So they don't actually store to both of them separately. Now you don't have a separate C, you're just carrying the H straight through and, uh, and so on. So take a look at the slides, right? And so here's a standard LSTM structure, a typical LSTM structure. Each green box now is an entire LSTM or a GRU unit. Again, keep in mind that the box represents an array of units going inside. Uh, you can even have bidirectional structures of this kind. Any, time, any place where you used a standard recurrent neural network, you can use a bidirectional LSTM-based structure. And so here's the story so far, we'll stop right here. Recurrent networks are poor at memorization. After having talked up recurrent networks, I've told you that you know they, are, they don't quite do the job they're supposed to do. Uh, they also suffer from vanishing gradient problems during training. 
error at any time cannot affect parameter updates in the too distant past. So LSTMs are an alternative formalism where memory is more made more directly dependent on the input rather than the network structure or the network parameters. Through a constant error carousal which, uh, which has no weights or activations but employs direct switching and increment detector, inc increments and de decrements from pattern recognizers. And these do not suffer from a vanishing gradient problem. But as you will discover in your homeworks, they do suffer from an exploding gradient problem. And so while this LSTM is supposed to have solved the problem of the standard recurrent network's inability to store things for too long, it turns out that all it did was increase the memory of the network from say three time steps to 25 time steps. So, and then you need additional structures to hold on to things much longer. But anyway, for now we're going to use this as our basic structure in the next few lectures. Thank you. <laughs>